Good morning. Oh, you're not seeing the wrong thing. My apologies. Uh, We're seeing bios right now. I know. I don't know why. Select your share monitor, please, to be the one where it's displaying. How do I do that? Sharing. Do sharing, and then and then on the left side under uh, it'll 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 say screen, and there will be a drop down menu. Yeah, now you're in. We're seeing your edit mode. We need to see your full your your full thing. Should be coming up. There we go. Thank you. My apologies, folks. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the Maryland Planning Commissioners Association Mastering the Master Plan Workshop. This is a the fifth in a series uh, or the fifth in the series. Uh, the regional workshop program that the MPCA started as part, or in 2019, as part of uh, implementation of its strategic plan, which was finalized in 2018. Uh, we had two in-person workshops in 2019, one in 2020, uh, and since the, the pandemic started, we, this is our second virtual uh, workshop. I also want to briefly uh, mention that the MPCA is having a conference October 26th and 27th in Solomons. Uh, and we encourage everybody to join us and uh, you'll, on the, the final slide, there'll be more information about it and a, a, a link where you can learn more and register. So uh, uh, just a brief introduction to today's uh, workshop. This is going to be focusing on planning processes, not what a good final comp plan look like, looks like. There are many ways to develop a comprehensive plan and this lesson will by no means cover them all. We will review requirements and best practices. A comprehensive planning is a distinctly local endeavor and the approach should be determined locally. Many of you will likely disagree with some of our suggestions and that's okay. I also probably say a couple things incorrectly. Please correct me in the questions or in an email and I will update the presentation. We have a lot to cover this morning so we will be moving at a brisk pace. We will send the presentation to all attendees after the workshop and post the recording on the MP MPCA webpage next week. All right, first I'd like to introduce our panel. My name is Joe Griffiths. I'm the local assistance and training manager for the Maryland Department of Planning. My primary role is overseeing the uh, department's regional planning program. We have regional planners assigned to six regions around the state. I also work closely in developing our technical assistance and educational resources and our interagency initiatives. Uh, and I'm here with you. I'm here with you today because I'm also the primary liaison to the Maryland Planning Commissioners Association. Uh, you also hear from Eric Lashinsky, who is the Chief of Comprehensive Planning for the City of Annapolis, where he is currently leading the process for Annapolis Ahead 2040, the city's comprehensive plan update. Prior to joining the city last July, he worked for 10 years with design and planning firms in Texas, where he worked across the country on transformative comprehensive plans, park system master plans, small area plans, and corridor plans for jurisdictions of various sizes. Most recently, he completed a 20-year comprehensive plan for Hot Springs, Arkansas, a pedestrian mobility master plan for downtown Galveston, Texas, urban design guidelines for transit-oriented development in Austin, and was beginning to work on an equitable access to nature plan for Montgomery Parks, MNCPPC, at the start of the pandemic. He began his career with the National Land Conserv Conservation Organization, Trust for Public Land, where he helped advance public open space initiatives throughout the Mid-Atlantic region, including Baltimore's Gwynn's Falls Trail, the East River Waterfront in Brooklyn, New York, New York City's Community Garden Land Trusts, I meant to ask you how to pronounce this, uh, Eric, sorry, the Barnegat Bay Century Plan on the New Jersey Shore, I'm sure I got that wrong, and numerous conservation projects within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. A native Annapolitan, he left Maryland in the mid-1990s to earn a bachelor's degree in political science and economics from Columbia University, and later a master's in architecture degree from Rice University. He's happy to be back in Maryland. You also hear from Krishna Emakundi, who is a planner with the Maryland Department of Planning's Projections and State Data Center Unit. He has previously worked as a researcher with state departments of economic development in Texas and Missouri and with local planning offices in Houston and the MNC PPC in Montgomery County. Krishna holds a master's in urban regional planning from the University of Pittsburgh and a PhD in urban studies with regional analysis with a neat regional analysis concentration from the University of New Orleans. And you all and finally you'll hear from Bill Butts, who has been a member of the Mount Airy Planning Commission for more than 10 years, serving as its chair for five years during which the town developed the 2013 Mount Airy Master Plan. He currently serves as the Mount Airy Planning Commission Vice Chair and for three years as the MPCA President, during which he wrote the current MPCA Strategic Plan. Bill was born and raised in a small community in Central Texas. 
He earned a BA in English at the University of North Texas, Denton, and an MA in Communications, Radio, TV, Film from UT Austin. Phil has five years experience as a high school English and Spanish teacher in Schulenburg, Texas, 25 years experience as a telecommunications and cable TV marketing and business development executive, charged with setting and achieving annual and long-range growth and development plans. He also has an equivalent amount of volunteer experience developing and implementing strategic plans in the municipal and nonprofit sectors, and 15 years experience as a financial planner, advisor, and retirement specialist. And you will hear all, all from them later on in today's uh, presentation. But let's start off with uh, some poll questions for you all so we can learn a little bit more about our audience. So the first one is, how would you describe your role in planning? Are you a planning commissioner or board of zoning appeals member, planning or other staff, an elected official, a nonprofit or organizational representative, or a community member or other stakeholder? I apologize if you do not fit into one of those categories. We are limited to five choices. Whichever one best represents you. Yes, and for those who may be having trouble selecting uh, one of the things, please exit full screen mode. Okay, looks like we have a lot of uh, uh, planning and other staff here. That's great. The NPCA uh, really enjoys and appreciates its relationship with professional planners in Maryland. And uh, we understand the value of, of co -op or, or working together on shared interests. We, it was one of our themes for a conference a few years ago. All right, thank you. All right, uh, one more poll question. Which of the following regions do you most represent? Or would you describe as you best representing? The Washington DC Metro or Southern, Southern Maryland, Baltimore Metro, Eastern Shore, Western Maryland, or you're outside of Maryland? Again, we're limited to five full questions. So um, we ha uh, had to find uh, some to combine. All right, looks like a nice uh, cross section, both with uh, a mixture within the state and even a few from outside Maryland with uh, the DC Metro and Southern Maryland being heavily represented. It's two regions in one, that makes sense. Uh, so thank you, it's good to know uh, who we have uh, joining us today. And next we're gonna uh, look at the objectives for today's workshop. We will be focusing on the role of the citizen planner and what a planning commissioner needs to know. I know we have a lot of staff in the audience and, and much of this information um, is just as important to staff as, as well as planning commissioners. But this is a Maryland planning commissioner, so we're really going to be honing in on uh, the role of the citizen planner. We will not be going into depth on any of the uh, comprehensive plan elements, uh, but I will share resources that you can use to learn more about the specific requirements of a few elements. And the Maryland Department of Planning will be developing element-specific training over the next uh, year or so, uh, as, as we anticipate a lot of new comprehensive plans uh, in the years following the release of the next of the decennial, uh, decennial census. This workshop does also does not go into specific planning strategies, trends, or programs. It focuses on process rather than plan content. Uh, and something that I will be coming back to repeatedly, when in doubt, check with your jurisdiction's attorney. We uh, will be talking about state requirements here, uh, processes, but a lot of this stuff is defined locally, determined locally, and we always recommend you check in with your uh, town, municipal, county attorney. All right, so what is a comprehensive plan? Any planner studying to take the AICP exam can tell you that much of what we consider planning today can trace its roots to the U.S. Department of Commerce's Standard Zoning and Planning Enabling Acts of the 1920s, which provided states with model acts through which they could enable zoning, organize planning commissions, and formulate comprehensive plan requirements in their codes. Maryland passed its own Enabling Act in 1933. All right, what are the purpose of, what's the purpose of comprehensive plan? All right, one is continuity. 
Planning is a long range endeavor. Elected and appointed officials, staff, and stakeholders change over time. A comprehensive plan provides a roadmap that community members and representatives can use for making decisions and guiding growth even as the players come and go. Over time, a community may wish or need to change the direction of a plan. And we will discuss opportunities and requirements for plan updates and amendments. Every community has competing interests, property rights versus the desire to preserve rural land, the need for more housing versus the concern for greater density. A comp plan, while no means a solution to everything, can help balance the needs and interests of a diverse community. It seeks to strike a balance among many com competing demands on land by creating development patterns that are orderly, rational, and understood. A comprehensive plan can also protect public investments. A community should avoid digging up last year's new sidewalks to install even newer water lines. Planned, orderly, and phased developments are less expensive for providing public services. Planning can also protect and enhance valued resources. These could be environmental, important economic drivers and anchor institutions, or resources that support an equitable and sustainable community such as transit and affordable housing can also help shape community appearance. This is obviously a matter of taste, but one that can be determined by the community as part of the comprehensive planning process. Design or other guidelines can foster a sense of place. All right, Com comprehensive plans can also promote economic development. This could be in high quality office space, the revitalization of a dilapidated shopping center, or even workforce development. A comprehensive plan can drive location decisions of firms and establish programs for encouraging economic development. Can also provide justifications for decisions. It's something for staff and officials to point to when making those decisions. A comp plan provides a factual and objective basis to support zoning decisions and can be used to defend those decisions if challenged in court. And finally, it can help express a collective vision. It provides citizens an opportunity to brainstorm, debate, and discuss the future of their community. And the more input, the stronger the community support will be, both for the plan itself and for implementation of it. Uh, in the years that follow. So now we're going to switch to comprehensive planning specifically in Maryland. Maryland comprehensive plans are required to implement the 12 visions. The land use article describes each vision in a little more detail. Start, they started as seven, seven visions with the Economic Growth, Resource Protection, and Planning Act of 1992, and subsequent legislation has raised the number of visions to 12. So as you're working on your comprehensive plan, you can always ask yourselves, is it implementing these visions? The local government and land use articles include most of the state planning requirements for Maryland jurisdictions. Throughout today's workshop, we will be reviewing and discussing state code requirements. However, they are only state requirements. Many jurisdictions have their own additional, additional local requirements that a comprehensive plan or planning process must also meet. And I encourage you to consult with your attorney on what those are. As I mentioned, I'll be coming back to that idea multiple times. What we discussed today will probably be most applicable to non-charter counties and municipalities. There's a map here on the right showing you the uh, breakdown of counties in, in Maryland. Much of the content requirements for charter county comp plans are comparable to those for non-charter counties and municipalities, but the process is determined by the charter and other local regulations. And again, both charter and non-charter counties, as well as municipalities, must implement the 12 visions in their comprehensive plans. As I mentioned earlier, today's workshop will not delve into the details of the elements. The land use article provides some insight on the requirements of each, although I will discuss briefly the limitations of those details. These are the ones for non-charter counties and municipalities. I call these the if-then elements. If, a, if current geological information is available, a mineral, mineral resource element is required. If it's a municipality, municipal growth element is required. And if the plan for a county or a plan for a county is located on tidal waters, shall include a fisheries element. But the land the land use article serves as a framework for state requirements, but much of the language is vague and open to interpretation. It is not a planning cookbook that will tell you exactly what you need to do. This is something else I suggest that you consult your attorney about. For example, what is an innovative technique or a streamlined review? This should be discussed and determined locally. The comprehensive planning process is more circular than it is linear. There's no clear point A to point Z. Rather, stakeholders, staff, officials, and others should establish an iterative communication and feedback process throughout the plan development. 
There are multiple ways a community can prepare a comprehensive plan, and the most important thing is that people read the plan and reference, reference it regularly during plan implementation, whether that is during a comprehensive rezoning, reviewing and approving a site plan, or starting a new program. Comprehensive plans should reflect the community and its ethos. Eric will be discussing this an iterative process in more detail later. Here's an overview of the state agency review process. Probably heard of the 60-day review. So 60 days prior to the public hearing, uh, a planning commission is required to send our department uh, a draft plan for review. I'll be talking about this more later. On day one, we send it to our internal divisions for review, but also our sister agencies. Approximately day 30, they send their comments back to us. Our regional planners then consolidate these into one review. And by day 60, we send it to the jurisdiction uh, who then is required to include that in the public record for the, um, the, the public hearing, the planning commission public hearing. They should also be uh, on day 60 sending it to adjoining districts, sorry, adjoining jurisdictions for their uh, feedback and comments. All right, now we're gonna talk about planning to plan. What you do in preparation when you know a comprehensive planning uh, process is coming up. We suggest you start with what you already have. All right. First, do you need a new comprehensive plan? House Bill 409 from 2013 changed the comprehensive plan review cycle from six to 10 years, but it also requires a five year implementation uh, report. This uh, image on the right is a document in 2015 that the Maryland Department put, uh, put together uh, to help jurisdictions with these questions. All right, planning recommends that a planning commission use the checklists to first determine if they should update the comprehensive plan. I'm gonna show you a little bit more about the checklist on the next page but to also use the checklist questions to discuss what they should consider changing in a new comprehensive plan. We think these checklists and, and this document are helpful even if you know you're going to be doing a new comprehensive plan. You should start with what you already have. So here's some examples of the checklist in that document, right? Does the comprehensive plan include all the required elements, right? Just, just uh, in 2019, uh, the uh, General Assembly added the requirement for housing element, went into effect a little over a year ago. All right, so that's a question to ask yourself. Uh, do our annual reports identify issues of concern, right? Are there certain trends that we're seeing that the current comprehensive plan is not addressing we probably need to update? All right, do we have any new designations, uh, sustainable communities through DH DHCD or historic districts or others that, that weren't addressed in the previous comprehensive plan? These are probably focus areas for a new uh, updated uh, version, new, comp new updated comp plan. There are other questions to consider as well. All right, um, you know, sorry. What are the population statistics and demographics telling us, especially with the new census uh, information coming out? How has our growth rate changed since the last comprehensive plan? And do we have enough available land for the des desired development? These questions spark local dialogue that can help really create the foundation for pre-planning and the plan itself. You also wanna consider other plans. Water and sewer plans are closely tied. Uh, these are county plans, but they're closely tied to development and comprehensive plans at both the municipal and county level, and they're required to be consistent. Have there been any market studies or economic analyses done in our community, either regionally or for the whole jurisdiction or maybe for Main Street that it will inform a comprehensive plan? You also probably wanna look at other comprehensive plans. Those of your neighbors, have they, you know, are they planning to grow or develop infrastructure in a way that may impact us? Uh, but not just your neighbors, you might wanna look at other comprehensive plans from other jurisdictions for new ideas, even outside of the state of Maryland. Uh, you know, how, how do they organize it? What, are, what were their strategies? What were their processes? You know, maybe it can spark some, some ideas for you to consider. If you want to develop and express a collective vision, you need to involve as many individuals and groups that have a stake in the growth and development of your community as possible. This is not only residents, but also the businesses and those who invest in your community, uh, nonprofits and organizations that dedicate their resources to your community, but also your neighboring jurisdictions. And your stakeholders are both internal and external when it comes to government agencies. Now you wanna look at different, it's not, this is not just a planning department endeavor. You wanna discuss it with other uh, agencies, departments within your uh, local government. Advisory groups are essential to a comprehensive planning process Staff and officials do not hold a monopoly on local insight or organizational capacity. 
Advisory groups can generate new ideas, describe conditions on the ground, assist with outreach and communications, and provide feedback on deliverables throughout the planning process. And they should be involved from the beginning to the end. I recommend a plan to complete the plan in the form of a charter or framework or whatever other name you want to give it. The advisory group can help you with this, and you can also share it with the community early in the planning process. Questions asked are, what existing plans will be studied to inform the planning process? How will the staff planning team be organized? And not just the staff team, the advisory team, other stakeholders brought on board. When will we compete, complete the existing conditions analysis? How long will community outreach last? And when will we have a draft ready for formal review? Comprehensive plans are uh, complicated. They take a long time. And there's always twists and turns. So you, you, there's no, it's unlikely that you'll be able to follow your framework letter to letter, minute by minute, but it's still good to have, a good have this framework in place so you can continue moving forward. So what is the role of the citizen planner in early stages? The planning commission should be involved early and throughout. One key aspect that they can help with is analyzing consistent issues that they've had to deal with over the years that could be alleviated by a new and revised plan. Are there an excessive amount of variances or special exceptions on the Planning Commission agendas? Does the Planning Commission find itself having to work harder than it should to approve developments that would benefit the community because the regulations are inflexible? They can also help with advisory groups and the consultant selection. Many of you are pro probably familiar with SWOT analyses, which, is, which are a tried and true exercise that staff and planning commission can work on together to frame some initial themes and focus areas for a comprehensive plan. It stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So what are your strengths? And maybe you have abundant open space. So let's build upon that. What are, your, what are our weaknesses? Yep, we have great open space, but our main street is struggling. We wanna look at that. What opportunities are out there? Well, we're having, we're having strong residential demand. But the threat perhaps caused by that residential demand is rising, rising housing prices. So when you ask these questions, you, you go through this analysis early, it'll, again, it'll help frame or focus some of your, the areas you want to look at. You also might want to consider consultants. The pre-planning informs the need for a consultant, if any. All those exercises you've, you've already gone through. Now, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, do we have local capacity to do this in-house? If not, you might want to consider a consultant. Consultants may provide objectivity or an outside perspective uh, that's needed. Uh, you know, they, they could have done plans elsewhere, right? They, they can bring new ideas to your community. Something else you can think about is maybe you can prefer, procure the service of a, services of a consultant for only one or a few of the more technical comp plan elements, such as the water resources or transportation elements, and you don't need them for the whole plan. And finally, probably the most important question is, do we have the funding or can we find some? We'll briefly go over requests for proposals if you do, do to decide to go with a consultant. You want to have a variety uh, of uh, writers. Uh, you want to make sure you include the desired outcome and deliverables uh, for, uh, for the final plan, be this or for their work, be it one specific element or the whole plan. You really want to clarify the role of the staff versus the consultant. Um, obviously, lay out the budget. Uh, and um, if you have, say you have uh, um, specific funding requirements or uh, you're, you are getting, receiving some funding from a funding agency, you know, what are the requirements of that agency? And then you obviously want to learn about their future or the projects they've completed in the past and any references. Um, you want to leverage a variety of distribution methods and procurement plat platforms. You want to send your RFPs far and wide. You need to be proactive. You, want to, you can put it on your website, but don't think that that is nearly enough. You also have to understand and abide by local procurement requirements. Another time that you need to check with your local attorney. I put some links here on some um, potential uh, resources or, or, or websites and, and state agencies and others that you can, can help you uh, spread uh, your, your RFP, or get, the, get the word out about your RFP. And then when you get those proposals in, you need to be uh, set up a, a clear, direct process for electing, selecting a vendor. What are your criteria, right? You, your, your review team should know this. Is, you know, if your budget is particularly uh, constrained, right? Price, the lowest bidder, might be the most important factor. Right? But you also want to look at the quality of their work 
their demonstrated, demonstrated past performance. You want to set up a scoring system. And this should be understood by everybody reviewing the, the RFP, the proposals. And you want to have a mixed review team. All right, so what are some funding resources for comprehensive plan? It would be great if there were more, uh, but I'll go over a few that we have uh, listed here. And these are all linked as well. Uh, later on, when we send you the presentation, you can uh, review them. Uh, so there's some funding through the Community Development Block Grants, or CDBG. Uh, this is available for non-entitlement communities that have 51% or more low or moderate income persons. Uh, so there is a specific list of eligible jurisdictions, which I'm not going to go over now, but uh, when you get this presentation, you can look at those list of eligible jurisdictions. This funding is allocated uh, annually for planning and is separate from the normal block grant cycle. And you need to know to ask about it. Uh, Cindy Stone is the Director of Community Development Programs. Her email is linked there. I told her that I, I was going to let you all know uh, about this, and she said it was okay to contact her. Uh, so this is available upon consultation uh, with Cindy. Uh, so you need to reach out to her first. Another potential is the Grants Gateway. Uh, this is funding available for planning that address, addresses hazard mitigation, sea level rise, and climate change. Uh, and the funding could be used for whole or part of the plan, but it depends on how many of the resiliency elements are included. So if you know that you're going to be addressing one of these specific um, uh, topic areas in your comprehensive plan, it's worth pursuing Grants Gateway funding. It may only be available for that section, uh, but maybe you could uh, you know, use that funding for a consultant that will focus on that portion. Uh, and then there's the American Rescue Plan. This is not yet fully clear. We're still looking into this. Uh, and the interim rule is out right now. I think uh, final comments on the interim rule are actually due today. It might be this weekend. Um, I can't remember exactly. Um, it's not yet fully clear, but if you look at that interim rule, it says that funding is available for planning or an analysis to improve programs addressing the pandemic. Uh, and this could be not only recovery efforts, but planning for future pandemics or, or light, uh, you know, uh, community uh, uh, jurisdiction post pandemic. So we're still looking into this and we'll let you know once we find out more. Uh, but there's also a website linked here. It's uh, Maryland's local fiscal recovery funds website that has a lot more information. It links to Treasury's um, website as well. Uh, and then finally, if you're a municipality, I strongly recommend you contact your counties because uh, many counties may have funding, uh, at least technical assistance to assist with municipal comp plans. All right, now we're going to switch to outreach and engagement. All right, I consider, uh, I think of outreach and engagement as three parts, communications, outreach, and engagement itself. Uh, we're gonna start out with uh, communications. This is what you say. This is, in my opinion, this is the first thing you do. All right, you need to, essentially, why should stakeholders engage? This includes, why are we doing this? Our themes, frequently asked questions, any aspect of community education you're developing. Um, and you also wanna talk about protocol and message control. Right? You want to have you want to have standard messages that your stakeholders, when they go out and talk, or, and your 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 partners, when they go out and talk about it, right? They're they're staying on message. I mean, you have to trust them to be able to speak, you know, to their audience how how they need to. Uh, but you still want to have some kind of protocol and, and message control in place. You'll see on the left some communication guidelines we developed for an MPCA outreach project in 2017. Next is outreach, and I'd say this is the most important part: how and to whom you say it, right? You can have all sorts of fancy engagement strategies in place, awesome messages, awesome questions, but if nobody shows up, it doesn't matter. All right, you need to establish the roles of the different people that are assisting you with outreach. You need to gather and use communication assets from stakeholders, right? What, how can you leverage what your partners have in place to get the word out? You know, what are your methods? High tech, what are you going to use online, but also high touch, meaning, you know, you are going to go where you need to go to talk to people and convince them to get engaged. I can't stress enough the importance of getting trusted community leaders as the messengers. In many, in many places, people, uh, either government, local government may not be trusted or it, they just, it may be disregarded. But other local leaders can help uh, spread the word and, and, and get people engaged. And you need to track who is engaged. This is very, very important because you may notice over your outreach effort that you have some gaps in certain portions of your community, either demographically or geographically. And you want to be able to then uh, modify your, your strategies to make sure they're engaged. This is really, actually, I, I consider this not that complicated, but it really does require diligence and time and resources. And then the final part is engagement. How do you get them to respond? What will you do with stakeholders when you have their attention? Education is a key part of it. Uh, you want to let them know what, what you're doing, uh, but you also need to ask them questions. I recommend starting with the general and moving to the specific, going from the visioning to the regulatory. Start with a positive. Uh, but here, we 
you, I, I recommend strongly to listen closely and avoid unnecessary corrections. Somebody may be responding with something that is just factually incorrect. At some point, you, you, you might need to uh, correct them. But if you, if, you are un, if, you're over, if you overemphasize your corrections, people are going to turn away. They're going to say, this is, this, this is not for me. And you need to be willing to accept harsh criticisms. You need to just grin and bear it. Uh, you need to meet the needs of the stakeholders, too, especially when it comes to community meetings. A convenient time and location. Don't have an outreach meeting at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday at town hall. You're not going to get the people you, you need there. You need to consider food. What about child care? And for those uh, communities with uh, uh, non-English speakers, you need to have uh, translated um, materials. I'm not going to go over this slide. I'm not going to read it to you. But here's just some examples of, of general questions or activities uh, that you could do once you have people's attention. Have their attention. So here's some different engagement uh, methods. You need to mix up your methods. Some stakeholders will gravitate towards some rather than others. Some will love to do everything online. Some people will only want to show up in person. You need to summarize and categorize what you're, you're hearing. Provide instant feedback. It's very, very important at public workshops to ensure staff coverage. You could also have stakeholders or advisory group help. If you're going to be doing breakout rooms, mapping and other exercises and answering questions. It's not going to be effective if you don't have enough staff to cover. You need to train key stakeholders and community leaders to assist and lead. Something that's fun, you could do matching t-shirts. You know, let, let people know uh, for, for the staff, let people know who's working on this. Uh, something that I find particularly intriguing is a meeting in a box. This is where you're not going to get people uh, to come to town hall or to a public workshop, but if you have a community leader who can take a meeting and a, you know all the, all the materials for a meeting and go do a, a meeting without staff there, you know, you can really get some uh, valuable information. This takes a bit of trust, um, but this is also where the communication protocols come into play uh, and training comes into play. But this is one way to reach hard to reach communities. You need to determine and clearly communicate how you will use input before you get it. Will it help with visioning? How about thematic organization? How will you track the demographics of engaged stakeholders? And how will you adjust or respond if certain demographic groups are underrepresented? What about input that does not inform the comp plan? What are you going to do with that? You need to think about how you're going to, uh, what about big ideas versus smaller cumulative responses? How are you going to distinguish between those two? How are you going to use those? How will the final plan summarize input and or include complete feedback in an appendix? And you need to consider the distinction between and relation of qualitative and quantitative input. How do you compare use notes from a breakout or focus group uh, versus survey responses? Now we're going to uh, turn it over to Eric who is going to do a, a deeper dive into an Annapolis case study. Welcome, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, good to be with you all. Uh, Joe just provided an incredible um, overview of, of how to do engagement and outreach as part of a comprehensive planning process or really any kind of planning process that's applicable to just about anywhere. I, I would encourage everybody to kind of go back to some of that later um, through the recording. Or, the presentation that's made available because there's a lot to get into. I want to just provide a, a snapshot, um, a view into how we're doing things here in Annapolis as part of the comprehensive plan update that we're currently involved with. It's called Annapolis Ahead 2040. Uh, I'm in a unique position uh, as kind of the lead on this plan because I started my position last July. That's why I moved back to Annapolis after not living for about 25 years. So not only am I seeing everything with new eyes, but I, I, I have this unusual opportunity to kind of come in as an outsider, essentially uh, how you hire a consultant to do the engagement process. That's me. I mean, I, I <laughs> but I'm also pretty informed about Annapolis having grown up in the city. So um, whereas we might, Often, as Joe mentioned, uh, hand off a lot of the engagement work to an outside consultant that um, can bring some of that third party credibility, uh, new eyes, new ideas, um, innovative thinking for how to get people involved in participating. Um, I'm in a position where I need to really meet people, as many people as possible. Um, and we're also coming out of COVID, <laughs> which makes it very difficult to do that. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, I've really spent the next year, um, uh, the last year, just trying to get straight and, and uh, figure out um, 
where the city is today, um, how it's changed over the last um, 10 years since we last did a comprehensive plan. One thing that is unique uh, to comprehensive planning everywhere um, is that it remains one of the most challenging types of plans to, to explain to a, a broad community. Um, I've used metaphors ranging from uh, cakes to books to um, uh, other kind of pop culture. In Maryland, I found that the back of an old bay can says it best. Um, we're trying to create something locally that can be appreciated uh, by people elsewhere who might be looking to move um, to Annapolis. Um, so it has to be something that can communicate beyond uh, local knowledge. Um, it is a specific recipe uh, for how we want to evolve as a city uh, in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, may not be as simple as steaming crabs, but um, that metaphor works, I think. And then it's gonna be used by a whole range of people, uh, elected officials, planning commissioners, other boards and commissions, staff, everyday residents, business owners, people looking to invest in the city, and they're gonna be using it in a variety of ways. And that's where the tips come in. I mean, it, it has to be a document that can be um, accessible and, and functional for a pretty wide variety of people. So that's, that's kind of on my mind as we're in this process. Next slide. In trying to, um, yeah, this is good. Um, in trying to inspire people to be involved in our process, I wanted, I, I came up with this graphic to really help them understand that the comprehensive plan should function at multiple scales. It, it starts, I believe, at um, the neighborhood scale, you know, and, and, and then it evolves um, to a larger scale, the community, and then ultimately the city. And, and people may be able to have opinions about all of these scales, uh, or they may just have opinion about their neighborhood or the larger city. But this is, um, it's really important for people to recognize that they, they could have a, a, a strong opinion about something should happen to their neighborhood. Um, and that is a viable uh, way of participating in the comprehensive plan. Um, I, I try to encourage them to think beyond their neighborhood. So um, we, we kind of uh, can help mitigate the, the sort of not in my backyard mentality and, and, and figure out how their neighborhood connects to the larger city. But um, it, it, people know their neighborhood best, I think, and, and that's really, an important access point to the comprehensive planning process. Uh, next slide. We really um, well, I want to underscore, Joe mentioned this, this, the importance of understanding the demographics of your community um, as you begin the comprehensive plan. We, we had a consultant, BAE, uh, out of DC, um, do a demographic and economic profile for the city and really uh, helped ground us to how the city has changed. Um, when you look at these two charts, the, the blue bar is Annapolis, the, the green is Anne Arundel County, and the, the yellow is Maryland. And so you can see in the top, the, the Hispanic population has grown 26% in the last, um, you know, more or less the last 10 years. Um, other major demo, racial demographics, not as much. Um, and then the age, um, our senior population is really going through the roof, um, you know, whereas our 25 uh, to 34 is, is down 10%, um, which I think is troubling. Um, and, uh, you know, basically um, the, most of our other populations aren't really changing that much. Um, so you got to think about uh, not just how to reach the, the populations that are growing, I mean, that kind of factors into the comprehensive plan. If we want to grow certain demographics, um, what do we need to do? But from an engagement perspective, just knowing who's here and um, how, how the population has changed is really important to our process. Next slide. Um, we did something with this comprehensive plan that is, is different um, for the city um, this year. It, it's, it's really um, 
you know, strongly inspired and motivated by the events of the last year and just a greater, uh, when I say that, I'm mean, not just COVID, but, but it's a growing awareness um, of racial inequity in, in this country and, and most jurisdictions in the country. And, um, you know, Annapolis is no different. We're, we're, a, um, we're a city that I think has a history of inequity that goes back, you know, hundreds of years. And, and uh, there's a lot of signs of that on the ground today and the way, you know, the city is still can be very segregated in places and, and opportunities are limited for um, certain populations, um, particularly, you know, racial minorities. And um, so we really want to be cognizant of those vulnerable populations. And so we use the CDC's um, framework, the, the socially vulnerable um, in, index. Uh, it's 15, I believe it's 15 criteria you can see on the right we map those for Annapolis and, and it kind of confirmed a lot of what people who already know the city might already know um, where those populations are the dark the dark blues are those vulnerable populations um, and it kind of gives us something to ground not just our engagement but the whole comprehensive uh, planning process and so we can kind of use this as a base for understanding how we provide different city services and access to um, things like parks and public transit. Um, and so certainly means that well, if we're trying to get these populations involved in the city's future, we need to know where they are and, um, and that this is part of that. So next slide. Um, when I came on board, we had already done one survey. Um, it reached 385 people um, and this is sort of what we learned from that. And I'm not gonna to spend too much time talking about this outcome, but it, it's really just um, important to recognize that through the comprehensive planning process, it's not about doing engagement at the beginning and then moving swiftly into a, a, a kind of planning process that's only done by staff and consultants, but you really need to kind of continue that engagement throughout, go back to your um, population, your community members and, and other stakeholders, and really test out what you've heard, make sure you understand it as correct and, and get more input. And you're gonna probably pick up more participants along the way um, if you use different methods and you really just go out into the public. And um, even if you use the same methods, you're probably gonna attract new attention every time you do that outreach. And some Maybe the same participants who participate throughout, but ideally you're growing that um, community of participants. Um, next slide. Uh, so we've been using this graphic for a while. Those who've been following the process in Annapolis are probably sick of it at this point. <laughs> it's intentionally simplistic. Um, just trying to share the, the central importance of the outreach and engagement to the process. You know, this public surveys we we did up until 2021, um, the winter that we're coming coming out of, and and we're continuing to do the stakeholder meetings. I, I am said, saying constantly, um, any chance I can get, please email me, call me um, to set up a meeting. If you're part of a civic association or some other group, or if you just want to chat about a comprehensive plan, um, please let me know. We're just trying to gather input um, from every corner of the city and we're going to continue doing that through the summer, um, even as we've just recently released draft goals, metrics, and recommendations um, for public review and comment. We want to continue that process. Um, go to next slide, please. Well, you know, after that first survey, this kind of um, uh, disproportionate response was was recorded. You know, where the dark areas are the the higher respondents, um, and the the light green areas are where we didn't get so much response. And this is kind of a historic divide in the city, um, north and south. Sort of, um, it just kind of pointed to the work that we need to do to to reach more residents of the city. Next slide. 
it's interesting when you look at that, um, we have a, a group of very established um, civic associations, and that's uh, that's a primary vehicle for getting the word out to folks. Um, and so my first step was in understanding that, appreciating it, um, recognizing that, um, as, as I said, I'm, I'm getting reacquainted with Annapolis, you know, a large portion of the city doesn't have that kind of civic association uh, representation. And, and so that becomes a key challenge. Um, you could see the Greater Parole Civic Association is, is one of our more established groups, but they didn't have the participation that we would have wanted. And so that becomes kind of a, a first step in rectifying things, going back to them and saying, hey, we need to get more input from people who live in, in this area. And then um, if you go to the next slide, um, it, it's sort of not surprising. I mean, the, the if you know Annapolis and you kind of look at the data, I mean, we have, um, it's it's a class divide, um, to some degree a, a racial divide, not, not entirely, but uh, certainly an economic divide um, between North and South. And, you know, when you look at all those yellow and green dots, I mean, um, that also is a signifier of where a lot of our rental populations are, and, and those populations are not as easy to reach. They're not um, participating to the great, um, to the same um, uh, degree that homeowners are. They, they don't have that same kind of vested interest in Annapolis, and so reaching those populations, they're they're no um, less important uh, as an audience for for this plan. Um, they're going to be impacted by it and they should have a say in it. And so thinking about how to reach those populations becomes another challenge. Uh, next slide. It just kind of ultimately, for me, it boiled down to what could I say to populations to make this comp plan um, more immediately relevant and, and urgent? And it just kind of came down to these two questions. Uh, and, and I'm a believer that when you do engagement to um, community members, you have to ask the right question. You, it, it can't be um, overly technical. In my, unless you're talking to a group of people that you know are highly informed about planning process, you really want to get to sort of um, some um, kind of emotional in, you know, impulse uh, type of uh, feedback that I think could then influence policy decisions that folks with more technical understanding can then shape um, into something um, that goes into the plan document. And so these, these two questions, if you go to the next slide, um, played into a, a, another survey that we did that we just called the simple survey. It was really just a way of reaching people um, who may not have the bandwidth to um, this year or any year, frankly, um, to get into a comprehensive planning process. And it really just tried to boil down these um, basic questions um, as, a, as a really kind of um, basic way of, of contributing to the comprehensive planning process and giving us a pulse on, on where people stood and ideas they had and the way they see the city. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you can have you know, people access while they're on the bus, you know, through a, a QR code. There's lots of ways to get this kind of simple survey out to people um, if you're creative about it. Uh, next slide. Uh, ultimately, uh, I use this graphic a few times, you know, just to kind of remind people that we're, as we develop the plan, we're factoring a, a number of, of things that we're hearing. Um, we're, we're taking positions on, on what's working and what hasn't based on um, what we're hearing and uh, a kind of track record. And then we're, we're factoring a lot of data. And, um, and so this, this calculation evolves. It's, you know, the answer changes as we go through the process um, and we get more information. Um, and I just want to remind, always constantly remind people that it is iterative. Um, next slide. Uh, just say, you know, how we calculate the amount of engagement we do is um, is something that I think is very specific to the jurisdiction and how you've done the engagement. And we just tried to, we tried to package it at some point to kind of understand what we had done and, um, 
And it's helpful to remind folks that we've been comprehensive in producing a comprehensive plan. Um, and um, we're trying to reach people in a number of ways. And, and, you know, coming out of COVID, we did a lot digitally, but we're trying to get back to more in-person meetings and workshops. Um, next slide. And then that ultimately should change the way you talk about things, you know, iteratively. Um, I, I get feet, I get this question, uh, why does the city need to grow? Um, and as a planner, I mean, I, <clears throat> I, it's, it's beholden on us to be able to address that because um, it, it's, it's a fair question. Um, I, mean, I, I think uh, it's something that a lot of people who, uh, concerned about their quality of life are, are sort of asking. Um, and what I try to remind people is that um, when you think about growth, um, and this is just a, the, the kind of line of response evolved um, through our engagement process, it became clear to me that the same people who were concerned about growth were also concerned about whether there, there were enough restaurants and conveniences retail in their neighborhood. And, um, you know, so I, I had to remind those folks that, um, you know, the, the people that operate those businesses um, in an unaffordable city have to drive um, miles away. You know, they're coming from outside Annapolis to, to operate a store or a restaurant. Um, those people should be able to live in the city close to where they work, and that'll cut back on congestion. It'll help us address climate change impact emissions and so forth and you know so just thinking about you know what you hear from folks and how that could change the way you talk about um, complicated planning terms is very important um, so it's not um, you know just doing the engagement process to do the engagement process it genuinely changes the way you do things in the plan next slide this is my last slide. Uh, if you're still interested in seeing uh, how we're doing our plan, um, please check it out. Uh, there's a link on the main landing page of the city's website at the bottom. Uh, we did just release draft goals and performance metrics and recommended actions for public review and comment. And we're continuing to work on the, the actual plan document, um, hoping to share that with the public in, uh, in the fall. So. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'll hand it back over to Joe. Thank you, Eric. Um, it was great to see specific examples with graphics of you know a lot of the stuff I was discussing, but um, excellent work in Annapolis. Thank you. Uh, and there's Eric's contact. Uh, I think John might also be sending that out. Okay. Uh, well, outreach is, is definitely a significant part of the planning process, so I don't want to think that outreach isn't, uh, but we're going to look at just some other aspects of the planning process uh, now. First is uh, we're going to look just very briefly at an existing conditions analysis. Here are some examples from uh, some, some Maryland uh, comprehensive plans. Uh, and these are what you see is some, some tiles on the screen of things you might want to consider uh, as a snapshot of your community. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that existing conditions are just that. They're a snapshot, they're kind of a baseline. This is where we are now. Uh, and they're not intended to have conclusions or recommendations in them. They can lead to future conclusions or recommendations, but they are, it's really uh, where you are now. It's a picture of your community and it's, it's a place to start. I'm gonna talk about visioning. This is often completed early in the planning process. Uh, and it's it's very important to uh, for for visioning, hence the name, to include the visual component of your community, the feeling or emotional components of your community. Uh, you know, we're always striving to build consensus, uh, but I think we all know that a full consensus is likely not possible. All right, the vision is the dream and the plan is the path that you take to get there. So what about the visioning process? Uh, sharing some basic information is necessary to keep the uh, participants focused, um, but most of the education that takes place in a visioning session happens through the participatory exercises, not through lectures. All right, remind them that visioning focuses on the positive and the big picture. Some people may get bogged down in details, 
specific places or specific issues, that's okay. Listen and record and don't tell them they are doing it incorrectly, right? I mentioned earlier, uh, not, no, don't unnecessarily correct people. But try to draw them back to the big picture. How can their concern be translated into a larger vision for the community? And you should uh, use the whole group for information, examples, and perhaps some ground rules, but smaller groups for exercises. This will require group le leaders and staffing. Smaller groups prevent extroverts from dominating the conversation. You should provide immediate feedback following a visioning session, perhaps group report outs or themes, but also in during and after development of a visioning statement. Here's some two examples of community visions from um, Maryland Comprehensive Plans. I'm not going to uh, read them to you, uh, but I will. I do want to point out that they are in the present tense. Uh, they focus on uh, positive, they po have positivity, and they focus on that visual and feel. All right, and vision statements can be used as a test or a measure of goals or objectives or strategies that are later developed as part of the comprehensive planning process. Do they support and advance the community vision? All right, now we're gonna to turn to a more technical component of our, of our comprehensive plan development. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Krishna Akundi, Maryland Department of Planning State Data Center. Welcome, Krishna. Good morning, my name is Krishna Akundi with the Projections and State Data Center Unit. I will provide a brief overview of the projections and state data center, some of the principal sources we rely on when reviewing the demographics or population characteristics section of a comprehensive plan and end, the, uh, and end with how we develop population projections. Now the projections and state data center is a member of the Census Bureau state data center network. The purpose of state data centers is to make census products accessible and available to local communities. State data centers, including the Maryland State Data Center, customize census data for their state, counties, places, and other sub-county geographies. There are nearly 100 data sets available at the Maryland State Data Center website. These data sets come in large part from federal statistical sources. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, this is the State Data Center's landing page. There is a blue ribbon right above the main content. Each tab shows the data available. If you click on any tab, for, you can click on any tab for related data sets. The Census Data tab, for example, includes detailed information from the 2010 Census and summary information for prior censuses. Below the blue ribbon on the left-hand content page, there is contact information and links to the more popular items on our site, the Maryland Statistical Handbook, Population Estimates, and the American Community Survey, simply known as the ACS. These data sets are updated annually. We also announce uh, data updates on our right-hand content page. Next slide, please. So our go-to sources to verify population stats are the census, the decennial census, population estimates, and the ACS. Each source covers uh, specified geographies and is based on a unique methodology. Generally, for years following the release of the census, the intercensal years, 2011 to 2019, we recommend using the population estimates to get a count of the resident population. At the state and county geography, the population estimates are broken down by age, sex, and race. Now, these, uh, these data are actually available on our website under the Estimates tab. The, uh, the ACS is a survey and comes with a margin of error. ACS population numbers are weighted to the population estimates. So you can actually have a discussion or a presentation with both population estimates and ACS. To get co uh, population counts for smaller geographies, use the American Community Survey. For populations under 65,000, you would use the five-year estimates as opposed to the one-year estimates. The census explains that the difference between the ACS one-year and the ACS five-year estimates are like the difference between currency and precision. 
So we would uh, recommend using the five year whenever possible. We also suggest, so in sum, in summary, we suggest whenever possible to use the population estimates program or the population estimates for total population, population by race, population by sex, and use the ACS for socioeconomic characteristics. For example, questions about employment status, educational attainment, income, mortgage, etc. When state data center staff create tables, charts, and maps, we realize it is important to properly cite the source for our information. Proper sourcing and detailed citation is necessary for purposes of review and verification, so we encourage uh, the same. We update statistics annually and use the most recent statistics available in our reports and presentations. While the decennial census is an enumeration of every person living in the country, it is a snapshot in time. And with the passage of time, that snapshot changes. So when you're doing a comprehensive plan, it is a very long process. So obviously you cannot use the most recent uh, population data every time. But using data that's five years old or 10 years old isn't really helpful because obviously the snapshot has changed. So even if it's an update of a comprehensive plan or an amendment, it is important to consider uh, updating those demographic statistics. Next slide, please. This is our most recent population projection for the state of Maryland. Our base is 2020 and we project over a 35 year horizon. In 2010, the population was 5.77 million. We projected that in 2020, it would have been 6.075 million. And by 2045, there will be 6.87 million. Now, of course, if anyone has seen the uh, apportion member, uh, apportionment numbers that came out uh, from the Census Bureau for, the, for 2020, uh, our projection was actually off but I'll get back to the issue of population projections and revisions later on. Uh, the census and PEP actually provide the base for our population projections. Uh, so that uh, 2010 number actually comes from the uh, 2010 decennial census. Excuse me. That was telling me I was at uh, uh, my time limit or rather a, a midpoint. The census and PEP provides the base for our population projections. We'll be recalibrating our model to a 2020 base year. Uh, next slide, please. The department's authority to produce population projections is written in statute. Uh, we update projections every three years and make annual projections or annual revisions to our projections as necessary. We use a cohort component model. The input uh, data for the model comes from the Department of Health, Birth and Death Statistics. And then migration, uh, which is a residual. So the, the uh, previous, so we have 2010 population, uh, we get birth and death data, and then the residual uh, is migration. These data are then converted into fertility rates, survival rates, and migration rates. Our projections are bottom up. We produce population projections for each of the 24 jurisdictions and then add up for the regional projections and the state projection. In the case of jurisdictions in the suburban Washington region and for jurisdictions in the Baltimore region, we consult with the respective MPOs. So when we produce uh, projections for uh, you know, Montgomery County, Frederick County, and Prince George's County. Uh, we consult with uh, the, Was the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. And quite often the state data center's population projections are in alignment with or within a range of the MPOs. For those jurisdictions that do not produce their own forecast, uh, we actually offer our projections for them to use. Next slide, please. There are different types of projection techniques and projection models. And as I mentioned, we use what is called a cohort component model. 
and as I said before, the cohort component model is driven by births, deaths, and migration, and we convert those into uh, rates. Linear models are probably the most basic type of projection. Uh, you know, they are based on historical data. Now, if you do a linear projection, you can a simple linear projection, you can go back 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years, get an average growth rate and make the assumption that your population is going to grow at that same rate into the future. You can also develop a little more uh, uh, advanced linear model using regression techniques. Again, you're using historical data, uh, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, uh, you know, with population, with population growth, and you're getting a, uh, a goodness of fit number. And once you get that goodness of fit, uh, you're going to use that to project into the future. The housing unit method is something more of many of you are familiar with because that is what many county planning departments use. Uh, whether that's whether the the data comes either from building permits or from planned or from plan information, so you know about the number of developments, the number of uh, res uh, housing units in that development. You get the average housing size, uh, multiply those two numbers to get your population, and you're able to project that into the future. More advanced models are econometric models. Uh, these are models that usually you'll go to a consultant uh, if, or you would uh, purchase them uh, through a subscription service. Uh, econometric models are very expensive. So the big thing about any of these models is that whichever model you use, is dictated to a large extent by data availability and accessibility, uh, your budget, and also institutional knowledge. You know, this is what we've done for X number of years, and this is what the community is used to looking at when they look at our numbers, because any model you use will, will give you different numbers. Uh, but you know you can tweak them to come close to to what you need them to be. Next slide, please. So as I said, we use a cohort component model. Uh, through our model, we do population projections, total population, uh, household projections, average household size projections, housing unit projections, and labor force projections. We use a different model uh, to project employment and income. Uh, Aside from these demographic characteristics, we also uh, use a completely different model to project school enrollment. Next slide, please. So as I said at the uh, earlier, uh, you know, when we did our, we, we released our projections, our December 2020 revision, and we were off on the 2020 number. And we do projections, uh, you know, we update our projections every three years, and do annual revisions. And why do you do these revisions? Well, when you're developing a projection or forecast, it requires an iterative process, a process that begins with assumptions, assumptions about the economy, assumptions about the community, assumptions about development. You take those uh, assumptions and calibrate your model, whatever model you're using, because a model is just, you know, a, a, a empty box. Then you input data, you'll get results. Well, you know, you have to test those results, reassess what you've seen, and go back to the beginning if those results don't meet, quote unquote, the smell test. Once we are uh, satisfied or you are satisfied with the results and whatever internal process you go through to say, hey, these results make sense, you need to do an analysis and then you have to look at implications. Now, the Maryland State Data Center, when we uh, develop our projections, we go through each of the steps, but we're really not looking at implications in the sense of, you know, population growth, population, population growth drives demand. It drives demand for services, for infrastructure, you know, for roads, for sewer capacity, for schools. And all this has implications to a budget and to other uh, uh, ramifications. We don't look at that end of it. We're more concerned with 
you know, are the results in line with what we have seen in the past? And of course, what's important is what we do as a state data center when we develop projections is we take those projections uh, to local communities, to local counties, to local municipalities and say, this is what we've done. How do they look to you? Because the county has to assess and be concerned with the implications of those numbers. Next slide, please. So these are some of the data sources uh, that would be helpful when you're doing projections. Many of these are available on our website. Uh, you know, we have them on the uh, right-hand content page of many of our uh, tabs. Uh, but at the top, you have the Maryland State Data Center uh, website, and you can access a lot of recent data from there. Next slide, please. And thank you very much. Thank you, Krishna. Um, yeah, I encourage everybody to uh, ch uh, check out the resources that the State Data Center puts together there. Um, comprehensive, thorough, and frequently updated. Thank you. And right now we're going to look at uh, the land use plan itself uh, briefly. Something you may want to consider is a development capacity analysis, otherwise known as a, a build out analysis. Uh, this is where you, using your existing zoning, infrastructure constraints, uh, and the, the boundaries of your community and your jurisdiction, you can determine, you know, what what can we accommodate in terms of, of growth? And this is something that the Maryland Department of Planning has done in the past and will continue to do in the past to support jurisdictions. Right now, we're currently in the middle of updating our growth model, um, but uh, we've been in touch with many, uh, all the jurisdictions that planning and zoning in this state um, to get to, through a QAQC process. You also uh, want to inventory a number of aspects of your community. You know, what are those uh, areas served by public water and sewer? Uh, what are your environmental constraints and not constraints in a bad way these are obviously uh, many the environmental resources that we mentioned earlier uh, that you would want to preserve um, what is your uh, redevelopment needs analysis including infill capacity and this goes back to perhaps uh, as part of your visioning uh, part of the pre-planning you did um, uh, your, uh, your SWOT analysis you know how what what is your direction of this plan when it comes to to infill and how will that uh, determine you know your inventory in the areas that you want to grow and what what is available for growth uh, in your plan essentially what are your land use needs based on the projected growth uh, following the uh, many of the steps that krishna just described to us i'm not going to go into uh, this uh, table in, in great detail but i do encourage you to come back and look uh, look at it uh, this is one way to uh, calculate your land use area needs. Uh, you start off by determining the dwellings needed to accommodate uh, the projected growth. Uh, you're, you're averaging your household size and uh, considering your vacancies and what are the dwellings that are needed. Then you want to allocate uh, to your residential land use districts based on the permitted densities. This could be your rural area or your medium density, high density. Then you want to estimate your actual space requirements for those dwelling units based on those land use designations. You always want to adjust, adjust upward using a safety margin to provide for flexibility and choice, but also to avoid limiting land supply. This will result in the space required for new dwellings, which you then add to the existing development to calculate the total land required. These calculations can then be used to estimate square footage of commercial and office space, other employment areas, as well as supportive public facilities, open space, schools, infrastructure, and other community amenities. So this goes back to a lot of what Eric was saying about uh, the residential growth uh, driving a lot of the other amenities and uh, land use uh, demand. You may also want to also want to consider alternatives and scenarios or, or scenario modeling. This is most applicable to communities expecting significant change along the planning horizon. Growth or new expanded major employer or community anchor or wanting to address something like climate change impacts. Essentially, you come up with a, a variety of scenarios and you develop uh, metrics. This is from the Livable Frederick Master Plan. Develop metrics uh, such as jobs, you know, how is this going to impact your air and water, water quality? What is the fiscal impact? And then you can use these metrics as uh, part of your planning decision making. You can include it also as part of your, your outreach effort. Uh, this is kind of one way to, you know, start at a some options for the end and kind of work back, look backwards using metrics. 
um, what would be the policies and strategies strategies needed to reach each scenario, and then they all have their various constraints and trade-offs. You know, none of them are going to be the, the the absolute perfect aspect of your community that you're looking for. Um, what you know, what are the positives? What are the trade-offs? And then maybe you find something you know blending or hybrid of the different alternatives or scenarios. Ultimately, we know we're going to have to develop goals, objectives, policy, uh, policies, strategies, and actions. These are often used differently. This is just how I consider them. You know, this, this is not how they have to be determined. Uh, but there's a good way to think about it. You know, goals are like a desired state of be, being. They're kind of the next step down from the vision. You know, what what you want things to look like and feel like when you know after the plan has been implemented. Objectives uh, consider as measurable results arising from plan implementation. Where will we will, will we be? These could be quantitative, measurable results. Policies are rules for decision making that will implement objectives. This is how we think. All right, we talked about earlier one of the purposes of comp plans is to support decision making. This is an area it can. And then finally, strategies and actions are the means for achieving goals. This is what we will do uh, to, to implement our plan. And there's some examples in here from various uh, Maryland comprehensive plans. So specifically talking about strategies and actions, these are just some of the strategies and actions you can use uh, as part of that what we do to implement our plan. You know, things like zoning, where your growth areas, what about density, uh, what aspects are you going to prioritize, what comes first, and you can also prioritize decision making. Uh, are you going to provide incentives to your targeted industry clusters or even to homeowners? What programs might you develop or expand for affordable housing or even your staffing resources? Uh, who do you want to partner with? local nonprofits, employers, or even neighboring jurisdictions. And then finally, funding. Uh, well, it's not finally, but funding. Uh, these could be both locally developed and how and where are you going to pursue other funding, either through state, um, regionally, or even at the federal level. And you may also want to consider additional plans, which we're going to look at next, that can further be an extension of your comprehensive plan. Uh, other types of plans, these are usually incorporated, but not always, by reference into the comprehensive plan and serve to drill down to the details that a comp plan cannot. If incorporated, they have the same authority as a comprehensive plan. Often they are adopted after a comprehensive plan as an implementation, but implementation measure, but sometimes they are adopted prior to a new comprehensive plan and carried over into the new plan. If this is the case, they should be considered as part of the comp plan process, right? Do you know something that was developed years before? Is it still applicable? Is our new plan consistent? Yeah, do they still apply? Do they need or do they need to be updated? And uh, a comprehensive plan does not exist in a vacuum. It influences and is influenced by many other plans. Here's just a few of them and in designations. You know, water and sewer plans are required to be consistent with a, a comprehensive plan and vice versa. Annexations, if you want to annexation, annex an area, it needs to be included in the municipal growth element. Uh, MDOT priority letters, which counties submit as a part of the consolidated transportation plan every year. Uh, you're gonna, if, if the projects that are included in there are consistent with the comp plan, they're more likely to be included in the consolidated transportation plan. DHCD sustainable communities are also required to be consistent with a comprehensive plan. And then priority funding areas, which we work uh, closely with here at Maryland Department of Planning. If you want an area to be eligible for to be a priority funding area, it needs to be included uh, in a growth area in the comprehensive plan. It's important to note that uh, comprehensive plan is policy, not regulation, but it is closely related to regulation. Zoning is required to be consistent with the comprehensive plan as part of the implementation of the plan. There's a few code references where you find that, and if you're looking for a definition, of uh, that consistency, you will find that uh, in the land use article uh, uh, reference sections listed at the bottom. All right, now we're going to turn it over to Bill Butts, uh, who is going to give a Mount Airy case study about how they have implemented comprehensive plans and how they tracked track that implementation. Welcome, Bill. Bill. Here we go. Now I'm now I'm unmuted. Thanks again, Joe. It's it's uh, very special to be a part of this first workshop presentation on on master planning. Um, I want to share with you three tools, three processes that we discovered um, and piloted with um, our last master plan here in Mount Airy, 
Um, that was our 2013 master plan. Uh, we've started work on our update, uh, which will be the sixth uh, master plan that we've done in, in Mount Airy, goes back to um, late 60s, around 1970. Um, and um, Mount Airy has grown a lot at some point and it's slowed down a lot at others. Uh, we were one of the fastest growing communities in the entire state in the 80s and 90s. We almost grew too fast. Uh, we've been much more ordered, much more orderly, uh, much more considerate uh, in the last 10 to 15 years because uh, of the situation that got us into. Okay, uh, next slide. Obviously, the Planning Commission is responsible for coordinating and producing, developing uh, a comprehensive plan, a master plan. But the larger context of that is the community outreach, the community connection, the involvement of the community and key stakeholders in making that happen. Uh, I think of it as a, a broad and deep community connection that the Planning Commission and elected officials um, and everyone, all of the volunteers and citizens that are on commissions and boards, that's the essential context that we want to try to maintain uh, in terms of what we look at, how we look at it, um, what we eventually uh, turn up recommending. Um, so I mentioned community connection here because that ultimately becomes the desired outcome over time. Next slide. Okay, big picture um, to start with is the essential context of for the, the plan update that you're going to do. Um, obviously, that includes some basics, assessing what's the current status or developmental trend of the town vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the last master plan that, that you've been working with. Um, what's current feedback that you can gather uh, in terms of issues, concerns, opportunities that various community components and residents and stakeholders uh, would would like to share with you and make you aware of if you weren't already, but but to allow them to contribute that. Uh, that's extremely vital feedback. Um, and finally, in terms of the larger context of where you want to go, the vision of that that future, that uh, an extension that you want to, to try to help create with this plan, are there new issues? Are there changes in the perspective um, that exist from the time that you did the last plan? Okay, next slide. So three tools I said I wanted to share with you. One of the things that we did prior to kicking off our 2013 master plan, and we started early on this, we, we did our first uh, broad-based community survey. Um, and we had, uh, and we put a lot of time and effort into it. It, it took two or three years itself. Um, and then when our development of the 2013 plan uh, had some delays because uh, it took so much time, we, we realized that uh, we might need to update that to, to make sure that uh, it was fresh and current perspective. We had we did a, a paper and pencil mail out, make everyone aware that we want you to be involved with it. We had a 47% response rate in that it was essentially 2008 is when we uh, we collected uh, the returns on that. Just an unheard of response rate. but the community was responding to us and saying, thank you for asking. Yes, we would love to share our opinions and thoughts with you. Um, it took a tremendous amount of time to, to go through and to, and to analyze that. The second tool that we realized we wanted to try, and we totally believe in it now, was we wanted to not only deeply involve our citizens and our stakeholders and, and, and all of our groups, but we also, in terms of development of the plan, wanted to deeply involve our commissions and boards. We wanted to be sure they felt that they were a part of the essential development team because each one of those commissions focuses on a particular area, whether it's water and sewer or it's streets and roads or it's parks and rec, uh, whatever. 
or its sustainability. Um, and so we felt like it was critical to get them involved and as an essential part of the visioning team. So we uh, we did that, and I'll get into a little bit more detail on that. Finally, finally, because we did some research, some historical research to begin with, uh, of going back to the the earlier master plans, comprehensive plans that we had done in Mount Airy, and we really couldn't find any evidence or any commentary on the implementation of those plans. Okay. And certainly, especially during the 80s and 90s, there was a tremendous change uh, and, and growth uh, in the town. So we went into the process for the 2013 plan feeling and believing we not only want to hold ourselves responsible to develop the best and most appropriate vision and plan that we can, but we want to hold ourselves responsible for taking action on it and implementing it. And so we created what we called an implementation and progress matrix. And I'll, I will tell you about that and I'll show you a sample of it. Next slide. Okay, so this first tool, this first step is something we believe in now and we will continue to do it going forward. I'm, I'm fairly positive for each of our subsequent uh, comprehensive plan update sessions. A comprehensive town uh, opportunity via survey, via focus groups, via other feedback. Um, one of the things that, that I left out, because we did that comprehensive survey, primarily on paper, um, mailed back in or dropped off in 2008, thinking that very, very shortly we would be starting on the development of the 2000 uh, of the comprehensive plan update, um, when it it actually got delayed, we were concerned that the findings may not might not be fresh enough. And so we said we may need to do a bit of an update. We may need to to tweak, may, we may need to have some additional uh, feedback from the community. But let's do it a different way. We had a a very standard survey approach the first time around. Let's do this with qualitative research. Let's use focus groups. Let's listen to what people have to say in response to key questions. And then let's form hypotheses of what they say. We did 26 focus groups. We did them with virtually every sector in our community. We also did it, did it with our children in different age groups. We did it with, um, empty nesters, we did it with families still at home, we did it with single individuals, we did it with homeowners, we did it with renters, 26 of them. That Those insights combined with what we had gleaned uh, back in 2008 gave us confidence that uh, we saw the big picture. But for us, uh, the first step is to freshen the feedback ask the, the questions again, see if there are different perceptions or what's the same, what has changed in that regard. So that's the first tool. Next slide. Second tool is to build the team. Um, and we utilize every single one of our commissions um, in our master planning process because there are components of every chapter components of all the, the required pieces that we need uh, uh, in Maryland to make sure are included in our master plans. Um, so right up front, we give them copies of the last plan. Uh, we give them the outline of the, the new comprehensive plan and we say, we need you to freshen based upon progress to date in your area and your assignments last time, um, how would you tweak uh, the, the course of the last plan? What would you change about it? What would you extend? Um, we work with every single one of them. We have them come to our, our work sessions. Um, and typically we're doing those at least monthly, if not uh, more frequently, because of course, all of this is going on at the same time you're doing your regular planning commission business. So we have to make time for it. Uh, we have to split our attention between the day-to-day, month-to-month 
operation of the Planning Commission and the fact that we're also working on this very, very important process and document. Next step. Third tool. Uh, well, actually, it's still part of the second tool. As I said, this is some iter iteration here. We assign the master plan chapters and sections as appropriate to each one of our commissions and boards. Okay, we review uh, thoroughly um, what were our master plan goals uh, last time. What's the progress to date? Uh, we ask them to tweak those, uh, add any new ones, or maybe slightly reshape um, their goals and initiatives for that they would recommend for each of the chapters. Um, and then working with them, we we take all of that input and with their help we draft chapter by chapter the master plan they review it we review it uh, we also bounce it off of uh, our elected officials our council um, and as a result when we have done that and we see the building process uh, proceeding the final sign off uh, is fairly perfunctory because everyone is familiar with it and they've seen it take shape and they've seen it develop over time. Next slide. All right, so finally, it's produced. Then comes a really, really important part of this. How are we going to ensure we make progress on implementing it? Uh, this actually continues the teamwork and the coordination the essential teamwork that we we started during the development process and so we extended that was the idea let's let's keep those groups equally focused and equally involved let's all continue to work together to try to make this plan this vision happen um, and so that's we created a, a matrix for that possibility um, next slide Okay, so what that this does is just like we had essentially communicated responsibilities for who, for which group was going to work on which chapters and which sections, the same is true now when we list the goals, we list the key initiatives um, that each of those groups and each of the chapters spell out we want to take in order to achieve uh, the key goals. Um, it establishes who's going to be the lead in that. Um, and then we track on a uh, on a regular basis um, how that progress is um, is proceeding. Uh, and then that is shared. Um, in addition, one of the things we started uh, shortly after um, we created that matrix and we we issued the two thousand and thirteen plan was we created, an annual information sharing event where representatives of all of the commissions and boards, along with all of our elected officials and anyone out of the community that wanted to attend, they could share what were what was their progress to date on each of their assignments. Okay. The other thing that, that of course is, is happening is that on a monthly basis the town council meetings and also at our pc meetings um, we're we're getting updates um, of of what progress is being made uh, by each of the, the the commissions and so that's helping us see the bigger picture of how the reality of the implementation process is proceeding is it possible for us to uh to access the uh, attachment of a copy of some of our of the Mount Airy uh, implementation matrix. Is that possible? Yes, we... uh, Bill, the, uh, uh, your implementation matrix is available as a download on the um, okay. the docking station. I don't know how else you call it. Okay. PDF All right. Yep. Well, I'll it's just the, simply say it's, it's in the handouts it's, tab handouts okay i don't know where the handouts tab is so uh in it will be available to everyone uh when the recording is is posted and uh when people can when they're able to come back it'll, it'll be available then too will it not 
Yes, we can also, when we send out the presentation, we can also send a copy of that. Okay, super. Well, let's do that because I think it'll be self-explanatory and you can see that it has, it has three, four vertical sections. It starts with chapters, it starts with each of the goals, it then the, the middle um, column is um, key initiatives that, that were identified, um, and then the last section is is uh, most recent progress. So we we track it um, throughout, and on about a quarterly basis, we republish that for everyone in Sharon. Okay. All right. Next slide. Okay. My info. How to to uh, to reach me if you have questions or you'd like to you know discuss any of what I shared with you or you'd like my reaction to to anything that y'all are working on, please feel free to contact me. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Um, now we're obviously over time. I apologize for that. I hope that uh, some of you can still stick with us. We want to be able to definitely save some time for, for questions. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. I tend to over explain things. So again, I apologize, <laughs> but I will, tr I, I might skip a few slides or, or barely or not touch on them much. Make sure we have some time for questions. So thank you for bearing with us. All right. Uh, the last section is drafting and adopting specifically the planning commissioner's role. Uh, here's just a, a, a brief overview. I want to come back to the, uh, the slides I think I'm going to not spend much time on, but that, that 60 days prior to the public hearing is an important uh, time frame to keep in mind. All right, uh, the Planning Commission uh, should uh, conduct numerous work sessions throughout uh, the planning process, um, from all the way from pre-planning to the final document. Uh, these are usually open to the public, but they're not uh, for public comment. Uh, and it would be planning commission staff, consultants, and, um, and others that would be involved in the work session. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. Uh, you should consider whether you want a thematic plan or a topical plan. Uh, you know, the one way is elements are the chapters themselves. It's a perfect, the other things are perfectly fine ways to do it, but other ones can be more thematic where there's elements within or across chapters with themes such as sustainability, uh, equity, con connectivity. There's no right or wrong way, and so many are going to be hybrids of the two styles. I do want to talk about this a little bit about the uh, public hearing. So um, the PC, the Planning Commission does not need to vote on the draft it sends to the Maryland Department of Planning, but planning assumes that any draft that it receives has the Planning Commission's blessing. Um, and it's important to note that state agencies, we cannot deny, modify, or add to a comprehensive plan in any way. We only comment on it, and then that comment's included in the public record. Uh, we only get one bite at the apple, the state. If the Planning Commission makes changes after they receive our state comments and or, the, and or after the public hearing, they, you don't have to send it back to us uh, for review. I mean, you, if you have questions, we're always we're here to help, uh, but we only get one opportunity to com comment on it. And then charter counties uh, should review their charters and ordinances for specific requirements. Again, uh, talk with your local attorney. Uh, for the legislative body, um, they have four options. They can uh, disapprove or remand it, uh, and this would essentially send it back to the Planning Commission. Uh, technically, a public hearing is only is optional uh, at the legislative uh, level for this. We wouldn't recommend that. We would recommend the public hearing for any consideration of the comp plan, but that, that is the official requirement. Uh, the public hearing is required if it's adopted or modified. And then the, the final slide, uh, essentially before questions, are amendments and reviews. Now, why would you want to, uh, oh, first, uh, the amendment process is basically the same as the plan drafting process when it comes to like those 60-day requirements, when the planning commission sends it to us, the legislative body's uh, responsibilities. But obviously, it can be shortened based on the amendment itself. You might not have to do as much outreach, analysis, uh, but essentially, but the same you know, approval adoption process is the same. So why would you want to amend? Conditions change. You might have a new employer or institutional expansion. Uh, you might need to respond to an environmental challenge or need. You might want to add a growth or service area, perhaps in preparation for an annexation. Um, might be in preparation for desired zoning amendment. Spot zoning is not permitted, uh, but a comprehensive plan amendment prior to a rezoning will support consistency between the zoning and the plan. Uh, you may want to incorporate new master functional plans that I mentioned earlier, and there may be new legislative requirements. Um, so I already talked a little bit about HB uh, 409. Um, let me see. Oh, but specifically for a, if a uh, last thing I want to say, if a uh, a 
planning commission is doing their tenure review but does not want does not need to or consider that they need to monitor change the comprehensive plan uh, there's no requirement for the pc to hold a public hearing on that but they are required to report to their legislative body on whether the plan is act adequate there should be some formal communication of that assessment to the legislative body they should also let uh, the state know that they've done this assessment this can be done through the annual reporting process or a separate letter to us so we can reset the 10-year clock for the next year review uh, and if you look at some of the resources we've provided uh, you'll see we have uh, tables of the 10-year the cycle for all Maryland jurisdictions with uh, planning and zoning authority. These last slides, which I'm not going to go over to, are a compilation of, avail of various resources available to you. These are all linked um, and organized. We have the MPCA, Maryland Department of Planning, uh, other state agencies. All these are potential resources you may want to consider as part of your uh, comp planning process. Uh, we have some regional planners and project managers from various or, uh, state agencies or other state plans you may want to look at. Uh, and uh, again, reminder to check with your counties if you're a municipality. There's regional planning organizations, even uh, many institutions, Power Learning in Maryland, have a planning program. APA has some great resources, and of course, MACO and MML. And then finally, questions. 10 minutes late, I apologize. Don't forget about the MPCA's 38th Annual Conference, October 26th and 27th in Solomons, where there will be more comprehensive plan training available at that time. Um, so, John, do you want to help with questions? I've been sending them to you. You should see them under your, your questions tab. Okay. Um, I see one. I'm not sure how to get, oh. Okay, no questions there. My window is very small to see, to see the actual questions. Um, you can pop it out using the pop out arrow. The pop out arrow, undock from control pane? That is correct. That didn't do it. Oh, oh, I see. I need to undock the questions. Okay. Sorry, folks. All right. So, Joe, can you elaborate on the uh, requirement and what the five-year implementation report is? Yes. Yeah, so that was uh, when they changed it from six to ten years. Uh, they added the five-year implementation report requirement. We do have a, uh, a template uh, that I can also send out on our uh, on the Maryland Department Planning website that jurisdictions can use. It's essentially a narrative description of how the implementation of your uh, um, your comp plan has gone um, in the five years after it was adopted. Uh, and this can be submitted along with your annual report. So examples that we uh, include on this template are the development trends contained in the previous four annual reports filed during the period covered by the narrative, the status of comprehensive plan implementation tools, such as, such as comprehensive rezoning, to carry out the provisions of the comprehensive plan, the identification of significant changes to existing programs, ordinances, regulations, financing for pro programs, and others. Identification of any state or federal laws, regulations, or requirements that have impeded local implementation. Uh, future land use challenges and issues, and a summary of any potential updates to the comprehensive plan. Uh, so it's you know we we developed those as, as some guidance for you. It's really a narrative description, whereas your annual report is more you know quantitative. It talks about you know permits and, and other countable um, measures, uh, but that is, is available on our website, but I'm also happy to send it out. Uh, how does the state data center incorporator take into account local socioeconomic forecasts? I'm going to turn that over to you, Krishna. Krishna, still there? He's unmuted, just not talking. Well, I'll come back to that one. Tell me when you're ready, uh, Krishna. Um, Eric, when did you officially start your comp plan? What was your projected timeline to adoption? We started in October of 2019. Um, and I, I'm, I don't know what the, to be honest, I don't know what the original timeline was. I think there was some question because uh, we were all waiting to know what the timeline would be for the census data to be released. And that, that guides these 10-year updates typically. Um, you know, I think 
we wanted to have it done before 2022. Um, but then when COVID hit, things um, really kind of stalled. And uh, I joined in July, and, and we, we did a little bit of a reboot at that point, July 2021. Um, so at this point, we're, we're trying to have our draft um, prepared uh, in September uh, for release for public comment. and. The adoption process is still a little up in the air because we have an election in November and we're not going to be adopting prior to then. So that's another wrinkle in this process that we didn't really touch on. But Thank you, Eric. Um, and I see that it was requested that I speak a little bit slower. I apologize if at the beginning I was um, going very fast. I also have a tendency to do that. So thank you for reminding me to slow down. Oh, uh, here's a, more of a comment. Um, but it's good to know if comp plans are tied to hazard mitigation plans, FEMA grant funds available annually through MEMA, the Maryland Emergency Management Administration, uh, might be another way to fund the comp plan. So that's a good uh, uh, other example. Um, Kathy, I apologize if, if, if you said that should say 24 county jurisdictions. That's appropriate. You're right. There are way more municipal jurisdictions should not be ignored. I would never uh, intentionally uh, ignore municipal uh, jurisdictions. So you're right. I'll, I will fix. I can work on fixing that on the uh, the, the presentation. Um, uh, Krishna, are you uh, unmuted? Yes, are you available? Yes. Go ahead. So the question was, how does the state data center incorporate or take into account locals' socioeconomic forecasts? That's a good question. Uh, So as I said at the um, outset, uh, we are mandated to do projections. And what we do is uh, once we complete our projections, we communicate with the local communities, primarily um, counties, uh, to get their feedback on our projections. And we make... Uh, we take into account uh, their comments and their suggestions, and as a result, make adjustments to our um, to our forecasts. Uh, again, our forecasts are for population, uh, employment, households, et cetera. We do not publish forecasts for municipal for municipalities. The reason we don't publish them is because uh, municipalities uh, have the ability one to annex which means that there's no consistency if you do a projection because you can annex at any moment in time which you know if you're doing a projection you have to have you have to know what's going to happen or, or you can expect what's going to happen before you can project so we don't do municipal uh, we don't do municipal forecasts and we and also it's very difficult to get historical data uh, for for uh, municipalities especially smaller ones and in the state of Maryland, you don't have birth and death data at, at the municipal level. I hope that answered your question. If not, uh, you have my email address, and I'm willing. And uh, I or others on staff can be uh, can provide a more detailed response. Great, thank you, Krishna. And the last question I see here is: uh, What feedback loops were provided to citizens and stakeholders later in the process when drafts started starting taking final form? I'm guessing that's for you, Eric. Uh, if you have any follow up on that, I can repeat it again if you'd like me to. Sure. Um, the, the way we're do there's a couple ways we're doing that. We're we're publishing the results of surveys, um, and we're sharing um, the presentations we give when they're kind of to the planning commission or city council. We um, we we make those available on the website so people can kind of see that. Um, and they, they, you know, if you listen to the kind of uh, way we present the comprehensive plan, we, we acknowledge the, the things that we're hearing each time. Um, but now that we're actually into kind of more of a formal draft content release, we, um, and we're, we're, we have, a, you know, a way to receive comments online to the draft content, um, we're going to be creating a comment. We have a comment log document that we're maintaining and we're going to be publishing that um, once we close the comment period and and 
updating that log with how we've addressed or uh, responded to the comments we received. Um, so um, yeah, that's that's how I say it. Thank you, Eric. We did get one more question. Uh, it's a concern that perhaps some of the, the uh, for uh, one Maryland comprehensive plan that's currently under developed that um, some of the citizens uh, may have not been heard and what are the options to continue to, to be get your opinions heard. Uh, I would recommend going to the, the jurisdiction, like Eric, Eric, Eric showed you the example from Annapolis, go to your jurisdiction's uh, uh, comprehensive plan uh, webpage and I'm sure that it still has ways to get involved, ways to give feedback. Um, and, you know, I would explore that. They, you know, most, uh, most comprehensive plan process, they don't shut down um, the input at any, in any phase. And I, I would look there first and just get, get in touch with, um, get in touch directly with the planning department and those, and those staff that are involved in it uh, and express, you know, how you, you, you still have some suggestions for the, for the comprehensive plan. I know you're talking about uh, uh, civic associations. So, um, you know, as a, as a civic association, I think you could, um, you know, reach out to them. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they are, they are still taking input. And, and you know, and in all, all phases of the, the comprehensive plan, they're still going to have, you know, public hearings and, 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 and those kind of uh, more public meetings. All right, well, th uh, I want to thank everybody. I think I got all the questions. If I forgot one, you have my contact information. You have the contact information of, of, of everyone else. Uh, don't forget the Maryland Planning Commissioner Association Conference in October. If you're looking for more comprehensive plan training, and then uh, the Maryland Department of Planning itself will also be uh, developing some additional training over the next year or so um, to, to look at some other aspects of, of comprehensive planning. Um, and we appreciate your time today. I know it's 20 minutes past when we said we'd be done. Uh, I hope everybody has a, an excellent rest of their Friday and, and a wonderful weekend. Anything else from the panelists? There's one more question, Joe. Oh, thanks. And what is the best way for people that are not necessarily residents of a district, like a statewide nonprofit organization with an interest in the housing or transportation element of the plan, uh, to engage in the process. Um, okay, we've got some more coming coming in here. Um, so as I as I uh, mentioned earlier, the you know your stakeholders aren't limited to people that uh, only live um, or necessarily even work within a community. Uh, and I think it's a statewide nonprofit organization. They work in all of the communities, right? Um, so you know you would you would. In, engage i mean you you have an equivalent voice uh to other people that that uh, are going to engage in it and um you know you if they're uh looking for you know, local communities are always looking for stakeholders and other organizations to help you know spread the word about their work right i mentioned you know having uh, decentralized meetings um there and so you know you could you could pursue that with them you know have, reach out and, and offer I mean, oftentimes it's offering help to to the project team that's leading uh, the outreach effort, leading the comp plan. You know, they 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 want the help. They want people to to share and to bring other people on board. So I think one of the best ways would be, you know, to offer that help to them, and um, you'll 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 get their attention, and, and you'll be able to engage in the process because it's not only limited to you know residents in that community. What is the time frame for the development capacity analysis being undertaken by MVP for counties? Good question that I don't fully have the answer to right now. Uh, what I can say is that um, you know we've uh, we've done the zoning portion of it, and we're working on uh, later refinements right now. There's a lot of uh, uh, you know modeling and uh, technological uh, processes still that need to be applied to it that I can't. I can't possibly explain to you, um, but we are dil diligently working on it, and I, I can't give you an exact time frame. But we we understand the the interest and demand uh, in our uh, DCAs, and we are uh, we are absolutely working on it. And we've made a lot of progress. And I want to thank all uh, the jurisdictions that did provide us feedback uh, when we sent out our uh, original zoning sheets to them um, to to make sure we 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 got it right. 
All right, I guess once again, anything from the uh, panelists, unless there's another question? Go on, panelists, final thoughts. Hmm. Uh, no, I just, I would just say, um, you know, if, if you, if you're interested in getting more feedback from your communities or you represent a constituency that's not um, represented well and your company's been, just, I, just kind of piggybacking on that one other question is, um, just reach out to the people that are working on the, on the plan and your mm -hmm. represented officials. And, you know, I think there's just a number of ways to get involved. You just have to be vocal about it. And, um, and like, as Joe said, these, these processes are ongoing. Um, very rarely is, is the sort of process closed off to, to no more comments, you know? So even, even during adoption process, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of comments coming in, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, well, once again, thank you everybody. Um, and we appreciate your extra 25 minutes. I knew I should have made this two hours. Thanks to the panelists, uh, you're really providing those local examples and uh, process examples were a great addition. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, have a wonderful weekend. Yep. yep. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.